Good evening, I'm Peter Sharoshi and you are watching Drug Reporter Cafe. Today we are speaking about a trendy subject that is much hyped by the media, LSD microdosing. We could read countless reports about its alleged effectiveness in boosting our mental skills, but there has not been much scientifically sound research findings, at least up to now, because Today, I have the pleasure to interview a researcher who conducted the first and largest uh, self-blinded placebo-controlled trial on, on LSD microdosing, Bolash Sigeti from the Imperial College London. Bolash, thank you for accepting our invitation and welcome to Drug Reporter Cafe. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. So. Let's start with explaining what is LSD microdosing and why is it perceived as good for mental health? Okay, so psychedelics are obviously enjoying a moment in popular culture. And what has started that trend are uh, the research results from psychedelic therapy. And I think it is very important first to uh, make sure that everybody understands there's a big difference between psychedelic therapy that has generated a lot of promising scientific results and microdosing, which is a completely different use case of psychedelics. So specifically when it comes to psychedelic therapy, uh, typically it is a psychedelic use embedded within a larger form therapy. So most often the therapy lasts two to three months, something like that, and uh, there are one or two drug sessions within that uh, therapy. And typically, the drug session is on a high dose. So with LSD, we are talking about somewhere between two to 400 micrograms, which I would like to say is much higher than typically uh, uh, recreational users would use. Also, in terms of like mushroom, like, you know, mostly what is the uh, equivalent of a therapeutic dose is about five grams of dried mushroom, which is, again, higher than what the average recreational user would. So that's the therapeutic application. You are undergoing a talk therapy, a classic therapy, and within that therapy, you have a few large doses of uh, psychedelic experiences. Now, in contrast with that, microdosing is the practice where you are using psychedelics in very small quantities, but very frequently. So typically about uh, three times a week, two to three times a week, something like that. And as I said, the doses are much smaller as well. In the case of LSD, it is typically somewhere around 10 to 20 micrograms. And in the case of uh, psilocybin-containing mushrooms, it is about 0.1 to 0.2 grams, somewhere in that range. Um, what needs to be said is, is that microdosing is an underground phenomena, so it's not that there is like a very well-defined definition of the different people might be differently. And because of that, there is a, a significant amount of variability in what people mean by uh, microdosing exactly. Why is microdosing so popular uh, among the managers of Silicon Valley? You would have to ask the managers of Silicon Valley about that. Uh, at this point, I would like to add that this is a very popular notion that microdosing is very, very popular in Silicon Valley in the tech industry. I am not aware of any hard data set that would prove that. I think uh, this is something that everybody mentions about microdosing, but as far as I know, nobody has real actual data on it. It might be just something that is uh, too cool not to be said about microdosing. And it's a bit of a legend that uh, came, for, uh, uh, came to a life of its own. But I think what the appeal of microdosing is, is that you can get the benefits of psychedelics without the psychedelic experience. Uh, obviously, it is well established that why psychedelic therapy can be beneficial. But very often, within that psychedelic experience, there can be uh, uh, difficult moments. And not many people like those difficult moments. So, you know, the promise of microdosing is that here's a way of using microdosing where you can get the same or very similar benefits without having to undergo the difficult experience, which can be a psychedelic uh, 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 ritual. What evidence did we have on the effectiveness of microdosing before your study uh, was published? Let's distinguish between two categories of studies about microdosing. In the first category, we have the so-called observational studies. And the most critical feature here is that they do not have placebo control. These are typically online survey based studies where a researcher puts a questionnaire online and recruits microdosers online again who have to complete that questionnaire either before, after, or during the microdosing regime. The other big category of studies are the clinical studies. And very crucially, these clinical or lab-based studies uh, have placebo control in them. So 
The difficulty with the observational studies is because of the lack of placebo control. There is no way that they can provide evidence for beyond uh, placebo efficacy. So clinical studies are the way to go. But the issue with the clinical studies is that they are very expensive to run. Clinical studies are expensive in general, but clinical studies on psychedelics are particularly expensive because of the schedule one nature of the drug. So what we had previously is a, a, a relatively large number of observational studies all showing positive results and a very small number, specifically three lab-based studies about microdosing that had the placebo control. However, all of these had a fairly small sample size. And I would also like to say is that these studies are also by and large negative. I don't want to get lost here in the statistical details, but I think it is fair to say that by and large, if you look at those three previous clinical studies, they are negative. They were not really supporting the anecdotal evidence behind microdosing. Did all these studies uh, uh, research LSD or uh, do we have any other studies on other drugs? No, all of the studies that have been uh, lab-based studies on microdosing used LSD so far. So why and how is your study uh, innovative compared to the, to, to, to the previous studies? Can you talk about the methodology used in this study? So we call this methodology self-blinding methodology. And as far as I know, this is something which is completely new, not just in the research literature of psychedelics, but in the medical literature in general. And what we did is basically find a compromise between the previously mentioned observational studies and clinical studies. So basically the way our study was run is that everything was run through the internet. And that was very helpful to get participants globally. But very dif- uh, where it was different from your typical observational studies is that participants who uh, did our study, when they signed up, we sent them what we call the study manual And this manual was basically a set of step-by-step instructions, how you can implement placebo control at home without clinical supervision. I'm not going to get, uh, uh, I'm not going to explain all of the details how that works. But basically the way it worked is that you first had to hide your microdose within non-transparent gel capsules. Uh, so the microdose is just a small piece of blotter paper you put inside the capsule, snapped it, And then you were also preparing empty capsules, and those are going to function as placebo throughout the study. And then you were putting these capsules into zip bags, and uh, there was also some QR codes involved. You put them into an envelopes, you shuffled them, there was some random number generation, and so on, and so on, and so on. But the net result of the process is that people have ended up with capsules enough uh, for four weeks of microdosing but they did not know which of those capsules were microdoses and which of those capsules were microdoses. The other big part of the system is that when the QR codes were scanned from the envelopes, they're linked with the IT infrastructure of our study, and that gave us a way of knowing who was doing microdose or placebo at what time. So this is the process that we call self-blinding, where blinding has a very specific meaning in science. Blinding means it is that participants are unaware of whether they're taking a placebo or an active component. So we call this study design self-blinding because you are the blinding to yourself, which is, uh, 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 as far as we know, have not been done before. You are setting up your own placebo control, and that's the innovative part of it. That's the twist of the whole story. Others have used internet-based surveys before, but nobody put a placebo control on top. And this is very important in the context of microdosing, because as I said, typically the observational, uh, sorry, the clinical studies have a very small sample size because of uh, uh, cost considerations. But here we managed to find a way of doing a microdose study that potentially could have a large number of uh, participants and have the placebo control, and crucially, at a very, very cheap price. This study costed us about $10,000, which in terms of research money is absolutely zero. If we would have done this as a clinical study, then it would have been easily in the million dollar range. So roughly our costs are about 1% of an equivalent clinical study. So to sum it up, that's the, the exciting bit about the methodology is this combination of having placebo control, having a large sample size at a very, very cheap cost. So in your research, the participants were 
required to buy their own LSD uh, in the black market. So how could you make sure that what they purchased was really LSD or did you have any, any way how you could ensure? Uh, the short answer is no. This is not a clinical study. This is a citizen science project. Our results are not representative of any clinical microdosing regime uh, where you would know the micrograms, uh, uh, where you would know the doses with micrograms precision. This is a citizen science project that we examine how microdosing affects uh, real people in real life going about their everyday life. And I may add that actually in the context of microdosing, I think this is much more interesting than a clinical study would be. And the reason for that is because microdosing is something that has emerged from the underground, from people who are microdosing with the exact same variability that our study also represents. It's not like that, you know, the uh, microdosers who are uh, reporting about all these fantastic benefits that they are doing clinical microdosing, you know, that they are getting their LSD from a legal source. No, they're also getting it from the black market that comes with the same variability as is represented in our study. So I think this is a crucial element of the study is that we don't want to dress it up as like a clinical study. Like, you know, I, I don't want to uh, 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 um, uh, advertise it as such. And yes, as a side effect of that, we are going to lose some control. But however, that lack of control, if from another perspective, is actually a positive because it brings us closer to the real life use case. How microdosing is affecting people uh, in the real life going about their everyday life. The video you are watching now is produced by the Rights Reporter Foundation, a non-profit organization which is not supported by any governments or political parties. If you like this show, please support our work on our website, thedrugreporter.net. Make a donation today and become our supporting member. It makes a difference. Thank you. Can you talk about the results and findings of your study? So first, let's just focus on the microdose group in the study. Uh, uh, so people who have been microdosing throughout this entire four weeks long duration. And that you can see with the rep here. So first you have the free regime, that's your baseline measure. And then you move along the x-axis and then you see post regime that's after the four weeks. And then there was also long-term follow-up, but I'm not gonna talk about that because it's less interesting. So if you focus on the red line, you can see that it increases sharply. And indeed, if you check the top bars, you can see that it actually increased in a statistically significant manner from baseline to after the four weeks long microdosing regime. So in a way that completely validates all of the positive anecdotes about microdosing, because people have been microdosing for four weeks, their uh, psychological uh, outcomes have improved. On this figure, you see the outcome specific to the mindfulness scales that we used in the study. But the basic story is true for all of the psychological outcomes that we have measured. It's true for uh, uh, well-being, life satisfactions, and all of the other variables. So mindfulness and everything else increases from baseline to after four weeks of microdosing for the microdose group. But what happens with the placebo group? That's what you can see in blue here. And as you can see that the, my, uh, sorry, the placebo groups improve somewhat less, but it is still statistically significant compared to their baseline levels. So yes, microdosers have improved throughout these four weeks of microdosing regime, but so did the placebo control group. And as you can just see by eye from the overlap of the error bars, the difference between the microdose and the placebo groups are not statistically significant in all. Suggesting is that there is no uh, statistically significant difference between the microdose and the placebo groups in terms of improvement. And again, this was true for all of the psychological outcomes that we have measured in the study. So in terms of interpretation, what does that mean? I think what it means is that uh, the anecdotal reports about the benefits of microdosing are true. That's clear from our data. Microdosers have improved in a wide array of psychological outcomes. But the mechanism behind those improvements, it's not a pharmacological one. It's explained by placebo-like expectation effects. Did you observe any adverse reactions to my microdosing among the participants? Uh, very short, no. There was one single person who emailed us that he's feeling unwell and he's going to drop out of the study, but none of the other participants. So um, short answer, no. So can you say that microdosing is safe then? I wouldn't say that. And the reason for that is because there is some uh, concern by the research community that uh, psychedelic activity at the uh, serotonin 2B receptor and activation of that is linked to heart problems. 
I wouldn't say I'm overly concerned about that, but I also don't want to publicly say that Michael was in DSA because of that issue, which is still under investigation by the research community. Are there any other interesting uh, effects or results which you would like to report? Yes, I think we do. And those results are about the acute outcomes. So acute outcomes means is, is that these effects were observed a few hours after the participant had um, ingested a capsule, either a placebo or a microdose. So I'm going to show you here on this figure one particular example, which is about acute emotions and use panels, which is a valid established of psychological questionnaire to measure these. I'm going to focus on this one specific example, but generally all of the other outcomes uh, follow the same pattern. So what do we see on this figure? So if you go to the bottom of the figure, you can see that there are two rows. One of them is condition and the other one is guess. And the condition is what participants have actually taken. It has two values, PL stands for placebo, the MD stands for microdose. Now, the row below is the guess. After they have completed all of these questionnaires, the very last question at every time point was that you ask participants, hey, if you have to take a guess, what do you think? What did you took earlier that day? Was it a microdose or a placebo? In the guest row, you can also see that there are two values. It's either a placebo or a microdose. And this way, the data is divided into two times two equals four categories. So let's go through these four categories. And let's start with the uh, leftmost one, where it's placebo, placebo. So in this case, participants have taken a placebo, and they thought it was a placebo. And on this particular scale, you can see that the effect, uh, sorry, the score is about 30. Like uh, you can think about it that that's the baseline value in the data set. If you go to the next column, the second from the left, that's when participants have taken a microdose, but they thought it was a placebo. So the difference between these two categories is the true drug effect, because they think it's a placebo in both cases. The only difference is that the first time they have taken a placebo, in the second case, it was a microdose. So you can see that the second column, the score is a little bit higher, but not by much. And if you just look at the error bars, you can just visually see that the difference is not going to be statistically significant. Now, the really interesting part is when you look at the third column. In this case, participants have taken a placebo, but thought it was a microdose. And now you can see that the score really goes up all the way to 18. And you can just, again, see from the error bars that this is going to be a statistically significant difference compared to the first case. And in the last category, when you have taken a microdose and you thought it was a microdose, you can see that it roughly stays about the same. Now, to be statistically precise, you can see some bars with p-values at the top. And I think that's important because that's basically the quantitative version of what I just said. But if you look at the top uh, bar, which is comparing the first and the second categories, that shows it has a p-value of 0.26. As I'm sure many of the listeners know, uh, finding is significant if it's under 0, uh, 0 0.05. So you can see this is uh, highly insignificant. If you compare the third and the fourth column, there again, the only difference is the uh, condition, then the p-value is equal to 0.45. So again, changing the condition in either case is making a statistically significant difference. But in the lines below, the p-values are very, very much below uh, the significance level. And the difference between the third and the first column is the opposite of what was it before. In that case, we are fixing the value of the condition and changing the value of the guess. So specifically about the third and the uh, first and the third column, in both cases, they take a placebo. The only difference is, is that in the first case, they have guessed it was a placebo, and in the second case, they thought it was a microdose. So to sum it up, what it actually means is, is that what makes a difference is not what participants have taken, but what they thought were they taking. Because microdosing is so much hyped in the media and many people try to make business out of the mi microdosing, do you anticipate any criticism uh, or, or any, like probably there will be many people will be disappointed? Um, so did you, uh, did you experience any, any, any reactions like that? Yeah, I wasn't brave enough to check the uh, microdosing forums when the study came out, but I did now. And uh, there was a pretty, pretty harsh internet stuff there. Let's just put it that way. Uh, look, I mean, of course, you know, uh, some of members of the microdosing community are disappointed by our results. And of course, you know, when we started the study of the vision voices is that let's show, you know, that it is more than just a placebo effect. I wouldn't say that, you know, we were committed to the results in any way, 
But the vision was certainly to show that microdosing is more than just a placebo effect. And then, you know, we went away, we collected our data, analyzed, and, you know, unfortunately, it's not the results that we expected or wanted. You know, it, it is what it is. We just have to swallow it uh, and publish our results. The methodology you use this is quite innovative. So, and and it, it has some promising, um, you know, opportunities to use it in other uh, research. Do you have plans to use it uh, to study the effects of other substances? Yes. Yeah, so we have plans for the future of uh, self blinding, and I should start with that we are going to launch a self blinding study uh, 2.0. It's going to run on the uh, Mydelica app. Uh, Mydelica is an app which is uh, funded by Robin Carter Harris, who is a very well-known uh, psychedelic researcher at Imperial College. Uh, disclaimer, currently I'm also working with him, so it's not a complete coincidence that for the second version of the study, we are going to use uh, his platform. We are launching this new study because it's going to be in a mobile platform and that's going to open up the experimental space. We are going to be able to do more compared to the first version uh, because it's going to be running in an app. And also, just like with every study, we have realized a few things that we could have done better in the first version. So uh, we feel that there are some loose ends in the study. And currently, we are designing the second version of the study running on the MyDelica app that we'll be able to address that. So that's about the microdosing uh, uh, future. Yeah. But we have also ambitions for self-blinding beyond microdosing. Uh, you know, the, 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 the entire concept of self-blinding, there is nothing microdosing specific in it, as you said, you can reuse it in uh, many other uh, uh, medical interventions. And the one protocol that we are actively developing at this point is for CBD oil. Uh, CBD oil, uh, similar to microdosing, has received a lot of very positive press, but uh, not so many uh, high quality research output in that area either. Um, so there's going to be very likely a self lighting CBD oil study. It's a little bit depends on the funding situation and how work is going in the lab, but uh, I think we're going to do it. Uh, that's also going to realistically come out potentially towards the end of the year. And generally speaking, we are looking for other researchers from other domains who can bring their domain knowledge, we bring self lighting and we could do good science together. Uh, I was actually just contacted by a researcher from Barcelona uh, who is studying aging, and apparently there is an entire community of people who are taking various uh, 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 research chemicals that's supposed to uh, 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 slow down aging. So that's also something that we are uh, going to explore, maybe like a self binding study about uh, aging medications. The appeal of the, uh, of the self binding methodology is that, again, it is somewhere between that of an observational study and a clinical study in terms of the level of control that you have. But the, the, I think if you would ask scientists, like, what is the critical different, differentiating factor between the observational and clinical studies, they would say that it's the, it's the lack of control for the placebo effect. And, and we have shown that we can solve it. We can run citizen science studies with placebo control. We show that it works, and we also show that this is a very good way to get a very large sample. Because our study, the microdose study, is the largest placebo control study on psychedelics to date, not just among the microdosing studies, but uh, about psychedelics in uh, general. And the reason for that is simply is because it was a citizen science study, but not a clinical study. So we see a lot of opportunities to exploit uh, the logic of self-blinding, uh, with drugs, and also with other interventions. And we are actively looking for collaborations in those areas. Balash Sigati, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. And thank you for all those who are watching us online on Facebook. Please uh, stay with us on, on Drug Reporter's Facebook page. And if you like this video, remember that a Drug Reporter is operated by a non-profit organization, the Rights Reporter Foundation. So please make a donation today. Thank you and goodbye.